Whew, that was a while ago <laughs> for some of us. So, uh, speaking of that, uh, last time I was here, we finished a sermon series on the Ten Commandments. That took two and a half years. Today, we start the Psalms. <laughs> I should be just over 100 <laughs> by the time we're done. Uh, no, we're going to look probably Psalms 1 through 8. Uh, today, we'll look at Psalm 1. But first off, uh, let me read to you a passage from the New Testament. John chapter 3, and verses 1 through 21. Uh, This is uh, Jesus and Nicodemus, an account that I'm sure many of you know well. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, and this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know you're a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I have said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered, are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you. We speak of what we know and we bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the Spirit in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that they, I'm sorry, in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. Light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his deeds have been carried out in God. This is the word of the Lord. Our Father in heaven, uh, we thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you for your many blessings. God, uh, just as was mentioned in the children's sermon, one of those is the blessing of coming closer to you through your word. And so, Father, we ask that as we take these few moments to look and study and think, God, that you would just uh, help open our hearts, minds, and souls to want that desire, to have that desire to be closer to you, and also to understand uh, Psalm 1 better. Thank you for all that are gathered here. Uh, Those that can't be here, God, uh, that may be watching or may be listening to this later, uh, Father, I pray for them as well. Be with Pastor Anthony and his family. Bless them wherever they are. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. To every man there openeth a way and ways and a way. And the high soul climbs the highway and the low soul gropes the low, and in between on the misty flats the rest drift to and fro. But to every man there openeth a highway and a low, and every man decideth the way his soul shall go. John Oxenham, who also wrote the hymn, In Christ There Is No East Nor West, penned this poem entitled The Ways. As one pastor notes on this poem, he says, Decisions determine destinies. Decisions determine destinies. The road a person 
chooses marks the course of his or her life for the present, but not only for the present, but also for the eternities that follow. One might wonder if Oxenham was looking at or contemplating Psalm 1 when he wrote this poem. The opening psalm of the Psalter paints a very similar picture to two roads being available in life, but ending up on very different paths, especially at the end of the journey. Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He's like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in season and its leaf does not wither. And all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. This psalm opens up with the word blessed. Uh, and is very similar to the promise of a blessing like the Beatitudes that Jesus begins the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5. But initially, the description of the man who will be blessed by God here is described negatively. Remember, when we, when we went through the Ten Commandments, we talked there's always a positive side of the command, there's a negative side of the command. This begins with the negative side of this Beatitude, in a sense, Right? It says, the one who is blessed of God, the man or the woman who wants to be blessed by God, does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. Well, what might that mean? What does it mean to, to walk in the counsel of the wicked? A lot of times, I think when we look at this idea or this phrase, perhaps passingly, we think of the person who falls into the wrong group of kids at school or the wrong group of ladies at work, or the wrong group of guys at the bar. The kid that starts wearing goth clothes and listening to hard rock, or the woman who plays office politics around the water cooler, or the, the guy who goes to the bar every night, slams a six-pack, plays pool, and darts. And certainly all that's possible. But so is the subtle shifting of someone's worldview as seemingly good friends family TV, and occasional shopping trips to the mall all cause us to consider and wonder what is important and acceptable in life. You see, the counsel of the wicked isn't just limited to the game down at the bar across the street, or the kids playing a poor imitation of rock music in their garage, or even people playing office politics around the water cooler. The counsel of the wicked can come from PG TV as well as R-rated movies. The counsel of the wicked can come from the perfect-looking, straight-A kid as well as the rebel without a cause. The counsel of the wicked can even come from regular church-attending, tithe-giving, postmodern-day Pharisees as much as the drunk who stumbles into the local diner for his cup of coffee the next morning. And if you think that's being tough, then you've missed what Jesus said to the Pharisees in the Gospels. Notice, to walk in the counsel of the wicked means to travel in it, right? It means to walk, to follow a path, to go somewhere, right? To let it start to guide your life, right? Because if you're on a path in the woods or on the mountains, right, you tend to try not to stray from the path too much because if you do so, more likely going to get lost. So walking in the paths of the wicked means that it's guiding your life more and more. And so one of the first questions we have to ask then is, in our lives, your life, my life, what people, what media, what sources of advice, counsel, values, perspectives are guiding your life, are changing the way you think, are asserting themselves on your will, are helping to form your resolutions and decisions? And then the follow-up question is this, are they godly? 
You see, the one who walks in the counsel of the wicked and continues in it eventually stands in the way of sinners. Now, again, this is one of those phrases when I think we first hear, like, wasn't that good that he stands in the way of sinners? Like he's blocking? No, he's not blocking sinners. He's not standing in the way as like, you can't get past me. Not like that, right? But standing in the way of sinners, in other words, becoming more like them, right? As D.A. Carson, uh, New Testament professor, says, the Hebrew means something more like to stand in his moccasins, to, to do what he does, to adopt his lifestyle, his habits, his patterns of conduct. To stand in the way of sinners is to move from just listening to their advice to actively being more and more like them. At this point, peer pressure isn't just something we consider, it's actually the guiding storm. The secular worldview has won out. As the world turns, the the wind blows, the cultural zeitgeist dictates, a man or a woman just immediately follows. They've bought into it all the way. No longer is the decision, should I follow into sin? But why wouldn't I? Everybody's doing it, and what's sin anymore anyway? Because there is no truth. Except the truth that there is no truth. That's a whole other sermon. And eventually this leads to sitting in the seat of mockers. Now I want you to consider this. I thought about bringing a chair up here, but I didn't do it. So the first thing, okay, so the first thing you're doing, right, is you're following along the path, right? You're learning the ways, right? Just like little kids. There you go. Thank you. Right? So you're learning their ways. You're becoming more like them. Then you think of a, think of a picture. I'm thinking of, a, you know, like a family, right? And you, you, have the, you have the little kids, like they're learning the ways. Then you have the person who stands here next to like the paternal or maternal leader, right? You're sta- but eventually, this person standing here is going to do what? They're going to be that leader, right? And that's what this is saying, is that it's moving from learning to becoming more like them to being the one who is actually dictating it out, right? You, you, you've, you've progressed in a negative way, obviously, to sitting in the seat of mockers. The, the whole thing's come full circle now. You used to listen to that person, right? And now you are that person. Now you're the one dishing it out. You're the one mocking others that don't listen. And if you watch someone's life, I know we've all seen this on TV and in movies, but in real life it's where it's really hard to watch, especially if it's someone you know. And if you see this, or some particular sin, whether, whether substance or sexual or criminal or whatever it might be, if you see this where it starts to grab a hold of them, and they consider it, and then they start to walk down that path, and then they start to become more and more involved in that, and then eventually they're helping others. It is a hard thing to watch. It's a hard thing to see. D.A. Carson again writes, at this point, someone has said, a person receives his master's in worthlessness and his doctorate in damnation. But the point is, okay, let, let's come back here, right? Because this is kind of like, ooh, this is kind of heavy and a little depressing. The point is, the person who wants to follow God isn't like this, right? The point is, this is not how we're supposed to live out our lives. The one who is blessed of God delights in the law of the Lord. Now, again, not in a legalistic, arrogant, pharisaical type of way, but a man or a woman who loves God and his word. The law, obviously, here at the, at the time that this was originally written, it would include everything that they had at that time. Now we have the whole Bible, all 66 books, Old, New Testament, right? It's, it's that whole thing. It's God's word. Even today, there is still a Jewish festival known as Simhat Hat Torah, the rejoicing in the Torah, to rejoice in God's word. The righteous one hungers for it, delights in it. This love, this joy, this delight of knowing God's word and of, of understanding and of wanting to, to have it be like water coursing through our veins, that starts to indicate that we truly are following God, that we have been born again as Jesus said in John 3. 
But notice too, as Carson points out, that everything in this verse counters, right? Verse 2 is a counter to verse 1. Meditating upon God's Word, feasting on it, absorbing it, that starts to give us good counsel. It starts to shape our actions, our lifestyle. It nurtures us in grace and gratitude. I come back to this quote that I've shared uh, many times. I can't remember if I've shared it with, with you here. It comes from a gentleman named uh, Dr. Frank Gabellian. And I was looking last night. Um, so he was the headmaster of Stony Brook School on Long Island for 41 years. He was actually the founding headmaster uh, I was uh, read last night. When he turned 80 on his 80th birthday, he was asked what counsel he might give to the next generation of Christian leaders. And he simply said these two sentences. Maintain at all costs a daily time of Scripture reading and prayer. As I look back, I see the most formative influence in my life and thought has been my daily contact with Scripture over 60 years. Over 60 years. We let a lot of things influence us daily. Things that we eat and drink, media that we take in, uh, friends, fellow employees, family that we listen to. But is one of those daily influences God? We need God. We need, we need, especially in this day and age, God to influence us and guide us daily because we have so much knocking on the doors of our mind for attention. And to be able to go through all that and sort it out and figure it out and know how to live, it's obvious then we need God's Word. We need God. We need to, as Doug said to the little kids, be praying and, and reading daily in a way where that water nourishes us. And I know much of what I'm going to say in this sermon actually dovetails very much with what Pastor Anthony said last week. That's not intentional. We didn't plan that. That's intentional from God, right? The encouragement to be in God's Word. Think about it. Dr. Frank Abellian said 60 years, 60 years of daily contact is going to influence you, right? It's going to change your life. Some of you, who's been here, who's here and has been married 60 years? Okay, I got one couple over here, and I got a couple couples over here, right? And I have quite a few patients. Had one couple, 75 before he passed. Now, those two or three couples, right? Put you on the spot here for a second. Has the other half been an influence for 60 years? Yeah, uh-huh, right? And those of us that have been married less than 60 years, 50, 40, 30, 20, 10, whatever, that's an influence. Now, what about God also being that influence for 60 years or more, right? Think of how your, your wife, your husband, your kids have influenced you. God should also be doing that as well. That's how we know His will. So many times people want to know God's will, right? You know how we know God's will? By letting Him into our lives daily. Scripture, prayer. Those are the two of the key right there. Living this way, the psalmist writes, plants a person deep down into the ground, like a, a tree with streams of water coursing through it, producing green leaves and fruit. A couple of old German scholars wrote it this way. They said, verse 3, this is how they described it. The green foliage is the emblem of faith, which converts the water of life of the divine word into sap and strength. And the fruit, that's the emblem of works, which gradually ripen and scatter their blessings around. That's not just a beautiful description of that verse. It totally coalesces with Paul's theology of the fruits of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit in the New Testament. And that's how it works. And so for some of you who have been Christians for a long time and, and you have that water, are you seeing new 
leaves and new fruit grow because that's encouraging and you need that. I have a, a poinsettia, well, if you saw it, it looks like a bonsai poinsettia, <laughs> right? I was challenged by one of my coworkers to try to keep this poinsettia from a year and a half alive, right? At one point this past summer, I put it outside. It literally looked like this, like a stick <laughs> in a pile of dirt, right? And eventually it started to form a few branches and then you can see some green growth and then the red leaves. And it, I mean, it's, it's the most petite of poinsettias you will have ever seen, but it's still alive. It's still trying to grow. As Christians, especially those of you who have been Christian a long time, are you doing that? Are you letting you know, God use you in different ways, bring you into different groups? I'm the ultimate introvert. If I could find a place that had mountains and ocean, ocean for Wendy, mountains for me, and we could retire there and I could never see another living soul, hallelujah! <laughs> right? But you know what God has done? <laughs> Through my wife and my kids, has challenged me to move out of that. I never would have believed that this job I'm in, serving people who are dying as a hospice chaplain would be perhaps my favorite job as an adult. And I never would have believed, never would have believed eight years ago and this comes from my kids, Aaron, Madeline, Abigail, Zephan. Never would have believed that I'd be leading role-playing games at a game store and playing hockey at my age. And it's because they asked me to. It's because they challenged me to. And now I get to meet people who don't know God, and I can shine the light in hospice, in hockey, role-playing games. I really am an introvert, <laughs> right? Like, I'd rather sit home and not go out of the house, especially because I drive so much from my job. But this has challenged me to step out of that, to let God use me in a different way and potentially break several of my bones. <laughs> We have to as Christians, we can't get, this is my concern for myself, for my wife, for any of you. As you get older, don't get stuck. It's good to know what you believe and how to defend it. Don't get stuck. Don't get, don't get like I want to, right? Be an introvert, go live in a cabin, and never see anybody ever again, and just be comfortable in your Christianity. This is totally not in the sermon. I'm like way off on the left. <laughs> Be willing to take a risk. Be willing to make a change. Be willing to let God use you in a way differently than you might expect you could be used. Because as much as we influence those around us, we can, in positive ways, especially our, our, our spouse, our kids, let them challenge and influence us. Okay, now let me actually get back to the sermon. The final phrase of verse 3 says about the tree, in all that he does, he prospers. What does that mean? How do we understand that? Because that could be a tricky one. It's not the prosperity gospel. Read Ecclesiastes and you'll figure that out pretty quick. It's not that everything's going to turn up rosy and you'll never face temptation, stress, or struggles in the world. Jesus tells his disciples, it's recorded in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that, that some of them are going to be arrested, they're going to be handed over, they're going to be persecuted, they're going to be hated, and some of them, yes, even some of them are going to be put to death. These things still happen today. They could happen in our time. So then, how does the person who follows God, who wants to do what's right, how do they prosper? Spiritually, in their relationship with God, 
their knowledge of His will, their ability to forgive, their ability to share His wisdom, to exert mercy, to give grace and forgiveness and gratitude, to use their gifts to help others prosper in life, to help the church grow. And this is lifelong, continual spiritual growth ever becoming more like Jesus and in doing so prospering in the most important avenue of life, our relationship with God. Not so the wicked, verse 4 begins. It doesn't get much clearer than that, right? Not so the wicked. The wicked are the exact opposite. Again, here's this compare contrast. They're the exact opposite of a firmly planted tree whose roots shoot down into the ground, fed by streams of water, Instead, their lives have become as worthless chaff. Where there is no root, there is no fruit. Spiritually, they are dead. They are condemned, as Jesus said to Nicodemus in John 3.18. One scholar describes the ancient threshing floors this way. He said, the threshing floors of Palestine were always on hills that received the best breezes. The, The grain would be gathered and brought up to the elevated place of the threshing floor. Large animals then would use various instruments to crush it. Then the ground grain would be pitched high in the air. The wind would blow the chaff consisting of the husks and broken straw, leaving the heavier grain to fall back to the threshing floor. The worthless chaff was gathered and burned so it would not be blown back into the grain. Toward the end of your Bible, our Bible, God's Word, the book of Revelation, especially in the last three chapters, we read these following words that support Psalm 1-5, that the wicked will not stand in the assembly of the righteous. Revelation 11, uh, 20, 11 through 15, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it, earth and sky, fled from his presence. There was no place for them. I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne. The books were opened, and another book was opened, the book of life. The dead were judged according as they had done and recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead in it, death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them, and each person was judged according to what he had done. Death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. If anyone's name was not found in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Revelation 21, verse 8. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magical arts, idolaters, and all liars... Their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Revelation 22, verses 12 through 15, the last chapter. Behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to everyone according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right to the tree of life and go through into the gates of the city. But outside are the dogs, those who practice magic, the sexually immoral, murderers, idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. Admittedly, those words are hard to hear, especially in our very much postmodern, politically correct, everyone's supposed to be tolerant and just get along age. And what's interesting in this day is people want you to be honest and genuine with them They just don't want to hear the truth. And the truth is what verse 6 says. The way of the Lord watches over the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. But this is not written to be a killjoy in life, right? It's written to be an eye-opener, to be a warning, to help us realize that maybe we need to make a change, right? If you come to a problem in life and you realize that the way you're going isn't working out and it's leading to a bad end, like I'm thinking of a road, right? You're going down the road and the bridge is out, but there's a parallel road and it goes over there and hey, it doesn't look too bad over there. Maybe you better think about how to get off the road before the bridge and get onto the other road. That's what Psalm 1 is. It's saying, yeah, there's two roads in life, right? How do you then get onto the other road? 
Psalm 1. That's what Psalm 1 is about here. For those whose lives are like chaff, chasing after the ways of the world, controlled by every passing fad and fancy, many of which you don't even realize you've bought into, one sin piling onto another, there is a way off that path, and it's Jesus Christ. As one man said, though, you have to start now, where you are now. Don't, don't come to church and try to clean up your act. No, that's not how this works. That's not what this is about. It's making that change now. You can't wait until you've cleaned up your act a little bit and done some good works and then kind of earned your way in. No, no, no. Just come now. Don't procrastinate. Confess that you're a sinner. Believe that Jesus died and rose again from the dead to pay for your sins. And then repent. Walk away from your previous way of life. Pursue him. Read the book. Like my little tiny bonsai poinsettia, right? Let some new growth come. Let God restore you through his word, through prayer. Delight in him. Delight in it. Let the Holy Spirit nourish you. Now, I know that I'm preaching to many people who have already done that long ago, who know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And then that's why I go back to the challenge I mentioned earlier. Are you continuing to let that water nourish you? Are you continuing to send out new branches, new leaves, new fruit, scatter that seed around, grow in your life with Christ? Because we can't, like my poinsettia looked like earlier this summer, just be a lone stick in a pile of dirt. Right? He calls us. To grow, he calls us to continue to be nourished and to to spread that gift of the gospel to others. Let me end with this quote from the famous Baptist pastor, Charles, uh, Charles Spurgeon. He says, walk with God and you cannot mistake the road. You will have infallible wisdom to direct you, permanent love to comfort you, an eternal power to defend you. Soak in God's word. Let it be that influence, that daily influence that drives you closer to him, makes a change in your life and a change in the lives of others. Our Father in heaven, we praise you and thank you for who you are, that you are a great, gracious, merciful, forgiving God. Father, guide us. Guide us to be, be, as that psalm says, fruitful trees, growing trees, nourished trees, not like chaff that the wind drives away. God, use each and every one of us, however old we may be or young we may be. God, use us. Use us. Strengthen us. Fill us. Guide us by your Holy Spirit. Guide us by your word. Help us to seek diligently for you. You are a wondrous God. We thank you and praise you for all that you are. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.